All right, good morning. I have my neuro coffee as usual. And it is, of course, say it together, perfect, thank you. Okay, so it is, it is Wednesday as we record this. And I got some, some Q&A questions that I wanted to cover because they, they were similar in regard to the fact that they both involved the pelvis. And so we can kind of knock these out in the, in the uh, home office here. And uh, so the first one comes from Justin. And Justin mentions um, one of my previous Q&A videos where we were talking about the compressive strategies in the pelvis. And so Justin says, you mentioned that when you get an anterior compression of the front of the pelvis, you get a shape change that will steal internal rotation and increase concentric orientation of the posterior musculature. I'm having trouble visualizing this orientation of the ilium and how this would increase compensatory concentric orientation of the posterior musculature. All right, so first and foremost, um, step one is to think differently. I think that a lot of people get a, a model in their head as to what this pelvis can and cannot do. And part of it is the fact that we use these plastic models. And so the, the relationships within the plastic model is, is such that it is actually a very limited view on what can actually happen. Now, having said that, let's go through what the anterior compressive strategy does, what it looks like, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the musculature involved. So if we look at an orientation of the pelvis, I'm trying to line this up with the camera so we can get a, a decent representation. The anterior compression is going to be on the, on the front side of the pelvis here. And so if we look at what musculature is most likely creating some of this anterior compression, we're looking at, at adductor brevis and longus, which are going to be a, a, attached here on the pubis. And so they're going to create this compressive strategy. And if you look at where they attach, um, they're going to be just medial to adductor magnus, which is on the, on the linea aspera, on the, on the back of the femur. <clears throat> so right away, we're going to create this compressive strategy um, of the femur into the, the acetabulum. But keep in mind, because they are, they are posterior, I'm also going to be pushing the acetabulum in an anterior direction. So as this compresses backward, I have a reaction here where the musculature attaches down on the femur and it's going to push it forward in that, that direction. So it's going to go like that. Okay. And so right away, I create what is the equivalent to an anterior glide in the shoulder. I, I create this anterior glide in the hip. So this goes forward. If that goes forward, I immediately create a shape change in the ilium that's going to promote concentric orientation of some of these short external rotators on the back side of the hip. Now, here's something that's really cool that people don't talk about. So bones twist and elongate and compress and extend. And so if I compress the front of the pelvis. If I look inside and I look at something like obturator internus, which has a, a very broad attachment on the inside, part of obturator internus is going to pick up eccentric orientation. And so what's going to happen is we get a physical shape change inside the pelvis. So if you look at where the, uh, the, the, the spine is on the, on the posterior aspect of the pelvis. Think about that actually turning outward slightly. So we're going to actually get a reorientation of part of this ilium, which again promotes concentric orientation of some of these short external rotators. So these rotators maintain their external rotation moment even as I move into hip flexion, which means that if I move into hip flexion, and if this is where I'm going to be checking my ER IR, then I have, I have concentric orientation of ERs, I lose my IR under those circumstances. So it's actually pretty straightforward as to how this can happen. But like I said, you have to be able to think differently. There's going to be people that disagree with me and they say, oh, you can't get that kind of shape change in the pelvis. I got news for you. It happens all the time. Um, so anytime you have a compressive strategy anteriorly, you're going to have a widening of, of the, the internal diameter of the pelvis. Is it huge? Absolutely not. But how much orientation change do you need to pick up concentric orientation that limits range of motion? Most likely not very much. So keep that in mind as we start to think about how we, how we uh, create these compressive strategies. So Justin, I hope that helps a little bit. Um, if it's confusing, I know it's confusing. So, so if I'm not clear, please ask another clarifying question. Um, I got another pelvis question from Brian, and it's a little bit more straightforward in this case. 
um, because this is just going to be an orientation problem. So Brian says, why would someone that has a, an extremely narrow ISA present with excessive hip IR and very limited ER? So, so this seems a little counterintuitive, but it, this presentation does exist. Now, Brian provides us a number of clues as to why we would see all this IR. So this person exhibits an excessive lumbar lordosis, is a fantastic squatter, um, and they also exhibit pronounced bilateral leg whip when they're running. Should we not expect to see the opposite measures, very limited hip IR and, and um, not limited ER? So if we're just looking at the relative position change for a, for a narrow, so, so a narrow is going to have an ER uh, ilium, they're going to have a narrow IPA, and we're making the assumption that they do not have full breathing excursion under these circumstances. So yes, Brian, you're correct that when I get the retroversion of the acetabulum, so as it moves backwards, I'm going to pick up ER and I'm going to lose IR in that situation. Now, you, you, you were uh, brilliant in some of the clues that you left in regards to the lower doses. So, so what you're going to see, this is above the pelvis. So if I have a, a narrow presentation, a typical narrow presentation, but as I anteriorly orient, as I anteriorly orient the pelvis because of the, the lordotic change above the pelvis, the acetabulum now starts to face more downward. I'm gonna assume we don't have a compressive strategy here that will interfere with this or enhance it, which can happen as well. So we're just gonna say that, that we have a, a now an inferiorly facing acetabulum, which is going to allow that internal rotation to, uh, to recur, if you will, because you're going to lose it under the initial retroversion of the acetabulum. I get the reorientation of the pelvis, and now I can recapture, or I'll see excessive internal rotation of the hip under those circumstances. So, so Brian, um, that's a great question. Justin, thank you so much for your question as well. Hope that was helpful for you guys think differently about how you're seeing things and uh, a lot of things become more clear. So if you have any more questions, send them to askbillhartman at gmail.com and I'll see you guys later.